V8 is officially dead, and four-cylinder engines are getting ever more popular. But if you're shopping for a car now, which engine layout should you get? An inline four, a V4, or a boxer four, which is more reliable, which will give you more power and performance, and which one gives you a better driver experience? Today we're looking at which four-cylinder engine is best regardless of car brand. At the highest level, on the surface, the inline 4, V4, and Boxer 4 differ by shape and form factor. The inline 4 is so named because the cylinders line up in a straight row. The V4 is named because it's in the shape of the letter V. And the Boxer 4 is a type of flat engine with two banks of cylinders on opposite sides of a common crankshaft. But here's the thing, each engine has its own set of advantages and disadvantages. The inline 4 is a very common engine design today, but it's also been described by some as a ticking time bomb. The V4 engine still stands out for being small and sturdy, yet it's less common than the inline 4. And the Boxer 4 is a shorter length and lower center of gravity. It's a signature feature of Subaru, and yet it's also been the culprit behind several Subaru recalls. If you were to randomly select a handful of passenger cars, chances are that the majority have an inline 4 engine, also called the straight 4. The reason why the inline 4 is so popular really all boils down to the engine's simplicity. It has one cylinder head, one cylinder bank, and one valve train. You can't get more simple than that. It only has one exhaust manifold. Since it has fewer moving parts compared to engines with multiple cylinder banks, we're talking about less energy getting lost. Because of its simplicity, it's cheaper to manufacture an inline four engine. It's also easy to repair. Since the cylinder head is the highest point, accessing spark plugs in the valve train is easy. The inline four is also lightweight. Speaking of problems, let's jump back to the inline four engine. It has its own slew of problems too, no matter who the manufacturer. First of all, inline fours rarely ever exceed 2.5 liters or 3 liters. Also, compared to other engine layouts, the inline four has a high center of gravity. There was a study that was done in a 2011 model year cars with the inline four engines. Well, it found out there were very few examples where a newer four cylinder matched both the fuel economy and power of a newly designed six cylinder. The smaller engines could also match the fuel economy or power, but rarely match both. Also, the four cylinder engines had an increased problem rate by almost 10 problems per 100 vehicles. I'm talking about things like the lack of engine power or even a hesitating engine. By the end of the 2000s, soaring gas prices and a crumbling economy caused consumers to be more budget-minded, especially when it came to gasoline consumption. This caused inline fours to become even more popular. They were everywhere. The Volvo 2.0-liter drive e-engine had such a complicated computer system that it's been described as begging to be broken. Or GM's 2.0-liter Ecotec engine that got its Camaro ranked as one of the least reliable cars ever tested. Or even the Mini's 1.6-liter turbo engine that ended up being described as a ticking time bomb. Timing chain and cooling system problems are two key contributing factors to this engine's short life. But let's talk about Mazda's inline four Sky Active engine. It has aluminum block and cylinder head with a pair of chain driven overhead cams. I'm talking four pistons, 16 valves, and one spark plug per cylinder. But what's interesting about the Sky Active engine is that the pistons are domed like a performance piston to raise compression and have a small cup on the top that's like a diesel piston. The cup acts like a mini combustion chamber. When fuel is injected, the cup allows the flame front to spread directly into this recessed cup on top of each piston. This means faster combustion a lower risk of detonation, but it can also cause some problems. For example, one problem was that the engines or the accessory mode weren't just shutting off. That was caused by one of two things. First, there was an issue with the transmission selector level module. And second, there was a problem with the brake pedal position sensor. To determine the operation of the starter button, both the gear lever and brake pedal inputs are used. But if the transmission lever happens to read any other gear than park, the button would not exit out of accessory mode. The engine also had problems with misfires and ice buildup. When an engine is working properly, the only two byproducts coming from the tailpipe should be carbon dioxide and water. That's it. The problem was that water from the combustion and condensation would build up in the exhaust and freeze. The frozen water ended up restricting the exhaust system's main silencer when the car was first started. That caused random and specific cylinder misfire codes. Mazda has since created an updated main silencer to allow the water to drain out. 
the engine can also face issues due to carbon buildup. The reason usually comes down to oil and vapors from the positive crankcase ventilation system. These engines have a large oil separator under the intake manifold on the side of the block. If excessive vapors get past the PCV valve, this can cause carbon deposits. These vapors can then get loaded with hydrocarbons over time, form chunks that stick to the intake valves, and that causes a carbon deposit problem. The problem can usually be traced back to cheap conventional oils. You see, your average oil will have high volatility numbers. That means it'll vaporize quickly when it's exposed to heat. Cheaper oils can become thicker over time and won't lubricate as well. And that also means there's a greater volume of oil vapor that the PC system has to process. On top of that, these engines can also have serious oil pump problems. An oil pump system enables the engine to circulate lubricants to all parts without any external system. You need an oil pump so that every running component in the engine is lubricated correctly. But once that oil pump fails, that's going to stop all the moving parts of your engine from functioning properly. Oil pump failure can be caused by irregular oil changes, sludge, and debris buildup, wear and tear, and broken oil passages. They can get so bad that the oil pump might even need to be completely replaced. The V4 engine, on the other hand, is far less common in the car market. It's a piston engine design where the four cylinders share a common crankshaft that's arranged in a V-shape. Normally, three main bearings support the crankshaft since the two banks of the cylinder share two crank pins. The V configuration can be positioned in different angles. The V4 is wider than a traditional inline four. It's also pretty short since there's only two cylinders in a row. Basically, because of its small size, it also means that it's pretty stiff. The V4 is a shorter crankshaft and is more balanced, so you get less vibrations from a V4 than an inline 4. If the cylinder bank on a V4 is at a 90 degree angle, the primary forces from each cylinder bank cancel each other out, and that leads to an overall smoother running engine. But here's the thing. One of the main reasons why the V4 is rare in cars is because the engine is rather complicated. A V4 needs two cylinder heads, two exhaust manifolds, two valve trains, and twice as many camshafts as the inline 4. More parts means higher cost for car manufacturers to make a V4 engine. On top of that, a V4 with less than 90 degrees between the cylinder banks needs a balancing shaft, and that makes things even more complicated. Also, V-angled engines take up a lot of space in an engine bay, and we're talking about a 90 degree V4 can quickly eat up the volume under the hood, unlike a slimmer inline 4. Honestly, the V4 engine is rare because the best thing it has going is its compact size, which isn't enough incentive to justify the manufacturing cost most of the time. That's why most car makers opt for an inline 4 for most passenger cars. The Boxer 4 engine features pistons that move toward each other horizontally. In fact, the movement of the pistons almost look like boxers throwing the punches in the ring. Really, the hallmark of the Boxer engine is that it has two cylinder banks and each piston has its own crank pin. Because the pistons move in opposite to one another, they counterbalance each other, and that creates an overall smooth running engine. Did you know that Subaru has been outfitting its vehicles almost exclusively with boxer engines for over 40 years? The one exception to this general rule is the EN engine series, which is used in Subaru key cars and trucks. The reason Subaru has taken this route for over four days is because of the many advantages of the boxer engine. Here's one of the most important benefits of a boxer engine, low center of gravity. That means it's more stable and responsive than the traditional inliner V engine, and that makes it safer too. If you'd ever get off in a frontal crash, the engine's more likely to drop below the passenger compartment instead of into it because the engine sits lower to the ground. Another benefit of the Boxer is the cooling system. Because of the engine's horizontal profile, oil and coolant remains are more evenly dispersed throughout instead of sinking down as you'd see in an inline or a V engine. By the way, don't get me wrong, Subaru may be known for boxer engine configurations, but that doesn't mean its cars are perfect. In fact, it's seen its share of various mechanical problems. For example, in April 2020, Subaru issued a recall for the 2019 model year Subarus that had been manufactured between June 2018 through February 2019. We're talking some 188,000 cars. The problem was a faulty fuel pump that caused the Boxer 4 engines to stall. And by faulty, I mean a cracked fuel pump. If that were to happen when the vehicle was in motion, it could result in a crash. In 2019, Subaru recalled over 450,000 models here in the States because of its Boxer 4 engine computer issues. Apparently, the computer unit wasn't programmed properly. The system continued to power the ignition coil even after the motor had been shut off. That led to higher temperatures, and a higher temperature meant that power could suddenly be lost and the engine wouldn't turn on. A year prior, in 2018, Subaru issued a recall to replace a valve spring fracture that could lead to Boxer 4 engine noise, malfunction, and even engine stalling. 
On top of that, Subaru has received multiple complaints over the years from owners over excessive oil consumption with its Boxer 4 engines. Now, there was never an official recall, but a class action lawsuit was filed. According to one owner, his legacy was using so much oil that he had to start topping off his own oil to one quart every two weeks. The lawsuit also claimed that over 650,000 people owned or leased one of these models. The lawsuit ended up being settled, and Subaru agreed to replace these engines with a redesigned Boxer engine. In general, the boxer engine's flat layout makes it harder to work on because the cylinder head is right up against the side of the engine. So even a simple test like swapping out spark plugs feels a lot harder. As well, double the number of head components means more parts and more components that will break down and need replacing. Everyone's heard about the semiconductor chip shortage, but did you know the car shortage will get even worse? Not because of this shortage, but because of yet another phenomena already in the work. Buckle up, because today we're going to see how Russia cutting off natural gas and oil supplies to Europe will cause more pressure on the global car industry, and how this will soon hit home in America. The conflict in Eastern Europe has been wreaking havoc on global energy markets. I'm talking about natural gas and oil. Supplies and prices won't be going down anytime soon. A lot of it has to do with the Russian gas giant Gazprom. And when I say gas giant, I mean giant. To see how big they are, you have to see their 2019 statistics. They had sales over $120 billion, ranking them as the largest publicly listed natural gas company in the world. But last month, they suspended their natural gas supply to Poland and Bulgaria. And now they threaten to suspend other countries' supplies too, if these countries don't pay in rubles, which is the Russian currency. That's no minor threat for the EU, because EU imports 41% of its natural gas from Russia. Yet the EU isn't backing down. Actually, they're going the complete opposite way, and it's already costing them big time. Germany, Italy, and France are the biggest EU buyers of Russian natural gas. They use it to generate electricity and heat, but they also use it to power their manufacturer industries, and that includes plants to make cars. Just look at Germany. Last year, Germany imported 32% of their natural gas, 30% of its crude oil, and 53% of hard coal, all from Russia. In fact, many manufacturing companies, including car factories and Germany run on natural gas to produce car parts and assemble vehicles. So much so that Germany's economy minister stated that Germany won't achieve full independence from Russia's supplies before mid-2024. Germany just cannot ban Russian imports immediately because they're too critically dependent on them. In 2020, Volkswagen depended on non-renewable energy sources for 80% of its needs, and BMW's dependency was over 60%. Over 50% of these car makers' energy consumption were from fossil fuels, the largest chunk being from natural gas. The CEO of Volkswagen Group, Herbert Dias, warned that being cut off from Russian gas poses a serious threat to Volkswagen itself. And CEO of Mercedes-Benz, Ola Kalensius, said that every company is looking at options to diversify energy sources right now. They're working closely with German authorities to secure their energy needs, just in case things get even worse. And BMW is also doing similarly. If Russia actually shuts off the pipeline, it would just add insult to injury. As it was, the German automobile industry has been struggling to maintain new car production due to the global semiconductor chip shortage. And now, the parts supply issues from OEMs in Ukraine. So, losing the access to Russian supplies would be detrimental to German car makers. If Russia were to shut off all the gas flow to Germany, well, they are prepared to a certain extent, at least in the short term. Germany already entered the first stage of their emergency gas plan. If things worsen, they'll enter the second stage, which is called the alarm stage. This stage is when the supply gets disrupted or when there's an extraordinarily high demand that upsets the normal balance. But even this will be able to fix without direct intervention from other countries. But if the situation continues the nosedive, the third stage is the emergency stage. In that case, Germany's network regulator, the Bundesnetzagentur, will need to ration out any remaining gas supplies or Across the country, if there's any remaining gas supplies at all. That's why German car makers are preparing now in case things do reach stage three and natural gas is no more. Like Mercedes Benz, they're looking at alternative fuels and other measures to keep car painting operations running if natural gas ends up being rationed. So that's Germany. But what about European car production as a whole? Well, major interruption to natural gas supplies will impair automakers' paint shops drastically. That's because paint shops need to create steam for heating and also compressed air. An alternative option 
and could be fuels like butane and propane that are made at refineries to process oil. But cost is significantly higher for those options. Most of Europe's natural gas comes through pipelines like Yamal Europe, which cross Belarus and Poland to Germany, or Nord Stream 1, which goes directly to Germany. And gas markets in Europe are linked by a network of pipelines. Last year, Ukraine was actually a transit corridor, mainly for gas going into Slovakia. From there, it continued to Austria and Italy. Germany could alternatively also import from Norway, the Netherlands, Britain, and Denmark via pipelines. But take a country like Norway, for example. Norway is Europe's second largest supplier of natural gas. But right now, they're already delivering natural gas at maximum capacity. Norway doesn't have the capacity to help the rest of Europe or make up for any natural gas shortages if Russia were to cut off supplies. But now let's travel east to Japan, because it's another giant in the global car industry. If you're wondering how the war is impacting car companies in Japan, well, Japan's factory output shrank for the second month in 2022 due to pandemic-related production issues and economic pressures. Even before the crisis in Ukraine erupted, Japanese factories were struggling with global parts supplies disruptions as it was. Car factory output decreased 1.3% in January 2022 from the month prior. Both Toyota and Suzuki have reduced production levels and things have been getting worse. The February 2022 output of cars and other motor vehicles slumped more than 17% since the month prior. This was the first time in four months that that had happened. And now, let's bring it all home. The natural gas crisis doesn't impact us directly yet, but it's not good news for us either. Canada and other countries start exporting natural gas to Europe. This could impact our supply and what we pay for it too. But it's not just that. Sales of cars and light trucks fell sharply in the U.S. compared to a year ago. There's only more uncertainty ahead because of part shortages, rising interest rates, and high fuel prices. Right now, Honda doesn't sell a single fully electric vehicle in the U.S. But recently, Honda said they're officially breaking into the battery electric market. Not one, not two, but 30 electric vehicles globally by 2030. And 20 will be for the U.S. market. This means more competition for Tesla, Rivian, Lucid, and many other car makers that are already in the BEV space. Today, I'll explain why Honda changed its mind. We'll also look at how cars will move to subscription services. Soon, buying a car will no longer be just about buying a physical hardware car, but it'll be more about a platform with services that will enable you to connect to modern daily conveniences, all for a monthly subscription fee that never ends. We'll also touch on Honda's new initiatives to make electric motorcycles and e-scooters. If I asked you to name the top EV company today, Honda wouldn't even be on your list. That's because at the moment, Honda only sells one electric vehicle, the Honda E, which is a subcompact car that's only sold in Japan and Europe. Actually, a lot of people criticize Honda for not embracing EV technology earlier, but they're not entirely correct. In the past, Honda, like Toyota, preferred to invest in hydrogen fuel cell vehicles as a clean zero emission option. So how successful or mainstream is hydrogen? Well, today, there are some 8,000 hydrogen powered cars in the U.S. are between 30,000 to 35,000 on the road globally. Compare that to 10 million plus fully electric EVs already on the road worldwide. So you can see where the money is. Analysis, expect an additional 2 million more EVs to be added this year alone. But the numbers aren't the only things working against hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Hydrogen fuel cell vehicles first started in 1966 with GM's Electrovan. Yet despite more than half a century development, hydrogen fuel cell cars are still expensive to produce. You can only find them in a few country or regions that have built hydrogen fueling stations. Part of the reason for low hydrogen sales in America is because of the lack of infrastructure network. Unless you live in California, you pretty much can't drive a hydrogen car. That's because California is currently the only state in the U.S. with a hydrogen fueling network. Once you leave the state, you're stuck. But what about battery electric vehicles? In the 12 years that we've had the modern electric vehicle, 1.3 million battery electric and plug-in hybrid vehicles have been sold here in the U.S. You can see it's quite a stark difference. Honda's always tried their best to stay true to their climate forward slogan, blue skies for our children. But right now, they realize the best option for blue skies is to embrace fully electric cars. And now that the combustion engine ban will be happening in the States and in many other countries, you can see why fully electric vehicles have become critical for Honda. Did you know that Honda pledged $40 billion towards electrification and software technologies over the next 10 years? But remember, technically, electrification doesn't mean they'll make all their cars bad 
battery electric. Rather, it means all vehicles will have an electric motor of some sort somewhere in the drivetrain. Most likely Honda will be investing a large chunk of their $40 billion in conventional hybrid vehicles and plug-in hybrid models as well. The recent $40 billion pledge and plan to roll out 30 unique electric vehicles globally equates to about 2 million cars. Of these 30 future EVs, two will be electric sports vehicles. One is expected to succeed the Acura NSX that recently departed the market. The bulk of these new EVs will mainly be crossovers, which makes a lot of sense, given how popular crossovers are in America. Did you know that Honda has already sunk 343 million bucks into developing their own line of solid state batteries? And they plan to bring these batteries to their new BEVs in the second half of the decade. For now, though, they will be relying on lithium ion batteries to power their upcoming EVs. Now, Honda didn't specify the actual underlying technologies for all these EVs, but Honda did note they'll expand the use of the Honda E architecture that they use in their current Hondas. Honda also shifting their business model. They plan to focus on hardware and software both. Right now, the core business is selling non-recurring hardware, which is pretty much car units, but they'll shift into offering after-sales services from software-based features. Take, for example, safety and navigation features. Today, you get most of these features as a part of the car. There's no extra cost. But with Honda's new plan, you'll pay for these features probably monthly or yearly. But Honda isn't the only automaker with this idea. Pretty much every other automaker you can think of is exploring this concept. You can think of it like a monthly car subscription service for add-on features. These fees will be to support things like content, services, and upgrades. Take GM, for example. They believe it'll generate $25 billion in revenue annually by 2030, purely on software and subscription services alone. That's not even including revenue from actual sales of cars themselves. Just look at your smartphone. In the past, we just bought a mobile phone, you'd only pay for cellular service. But today, we have a million apps on our phones, each operating different services. Many of these apps offer optional services for a monthly subscription fee. So now all you need is a smartphone to manage your home security system, operate your robot vacuum and track, your weight and diet progress, and so forth. This is how the smartphone became more than just telephone hardware. And that's exactly how car makers are viewing cars. It's no longer about selling one car, which is just hardware. Cars are now computers of their own. And this is just the beginning of many services we'll be able to do right from our car's touchscreen. Delantis believes software and subscription services will allow car companies to enjoy the type of operating margins closer to that of high-tech corporations. For example, Stellantis is exploring the possibility of offering services through tech platforms they're launching in 2024. Right now, they've dubbed it STLA Brain, STLA Smart Cockpit, and STLA Auto Drive. That's why Honda's taking this course the long term. To reach that goal, first, Honda will launch smaller scale EVs in Japan, like the Key Class. These are basically mini cars. While they aren't very popular in the U.S., mini cars are massively popular in Japan. The first new EV released in Japan will be a mini EV for commercial use, most likely a key van. Price? Just around 1 million Japanese yen, which is around 8,000 US dollars. After the key minivan, a variety of other models for personal use should follow, likely including mini SUVs. In China, Honda will introduce 10 new EV models by 2027. That's just five years from now. It's very interesting because not many people know this, but China is by far the world's leading EV market today. So it's a ripe market and huge opportunity for Honda. These 10 new models will be built at dedicated Honda plants in Guangzhou and Wuhan. Another interesting thing is that Honda's press release didn't even mention the European market. Given the population of China, I guess they're going for the big fish. So here's the big thing. Right now, Honda and GM plan to work together to develop a series of affordable EVs based on a new global platform. The purpose of this joint platform is to beat Tesla. Basically, in this joint venture, they'll use GM's next generation Altium battery technology, and they want to offer flexible battery architecture, outstanding power range, and performance. From luxury and performance cars to daily commutes, SUVs, and pickups, the goal of the Altium platform is to power EVs of every type and at every single price point. Together, Honda and GM are expected to produce millions of lower priced EVs starting 2027. These new cars will include compact crossover EVs, and they'll be sending some of these across the continents. In a recent statement, they said that they will share their best technology design and manufacturing strategies to deliver affordable and desirable EVs on a global scale. And that would especially include the key markets in North and South America and China. In a way, this is smart. Look, right now, EVs are expensive and most consumers know this. That's why EVs made in the joint Honda GM partnership are expected to be priced below 30 grand. Aside from external factors that drive up prices, the goal is to return to the days when cars were affordable and mainstream. So far, no financial terms of the new partnership has been disclosed. But the car makers have said they will be discussing future EV battery technology collaboration and opportunities down the line. One of the goals of collaboration is to drive down the cost of electrification.
communication, improved performance, and drive sustainability. Now, whether these new EVs will be based on Honda's architecture or on GM's platform is yet to be decided. But the two companies have agreed to share the bill for manufacturing costs, and the cars will potentially be produced at either GM or Honda plants. GM made a bold statement. They want to sell more EVs in the U.S. than anyone else by the middle of the decade. But to do that, they'll need a large portfolio of vehicles. And so partnering with Honda will help them reach their goals as fast as possible. Actually, did you know that Honda and GM have been friends for years? Honda previously invested $750 million bucks in GM's Cruise Autonomous Vehicle Unit. And now Honda and GM are co-developing the Cruise Origin Autonomous EV. The companies also have a joint venture to develop and produce hydrogen fuel cell systems. Plan to do this at a plant in Brownstone, Michigan. But that's not all. GM will be producing two EVs for Honda for the 2024 model year. Honda announced that one of these electric SUVs called the Prologue will be their first dedicated battery electric vehicle coming to the U.S. GM isn't the only large company that Honda's partnering with. Honda's also teaming up with tech giant Sony. They'll be creating a completely new brand together. In a joint statement, they said that their goal is to create this new EV company within the year. And this company will sell its first EV model by 2025. This new company is yet to be named. Some speculated it should be called Sonda or Honey or some other mashup. But we'll have to wait and see. Besides finding a marketable name, they also have to figure out the development, design, planning, and sales aspect of their brand. Honda will take on the responsibility for manufacturing the new EVs at Honda facilities. And Sony will most likely be responsible for building the platform for mobility services. At the helm, the chairman of CEO will be Yasuhode Mizuno, a longtime Honda executive. This is exciting because the pieces of the puzzle are starting to come together. Two years ago, Sony first debuted a concept car at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. This concept car conveyed the Vision S concept, which is an EV with a variety of sensors and other innovative technologies. At that time, Sony said this concept car was built to test autonomous vehicle technology. Then this year, Sony returned to CES with the Vision S02 SUV concept. With this SUV, they announced that they would form a business this year to put the car into production. The Vision S02 was presented as an all-wheel drive setup that output 536 horsepower. Pretty much that's all we know. The mid-size SUV will compete with the Chevrolet Equinox EV Polestar 3 and the Ford Mustang Mach-E. The new Honda Sony EV has expected to hit the market in 2025. With Honda's pledge to eventually be 100% electric, would it surprise you to hear what it means for their motorcycles? Look, Honda is a brand known for its motorcycles. It's the world's leader. Last year, they announced four electric motorcycles to debut in a few years. Last quarter, they released the CRF E2, their first production electric dirt bike with lithium-ion battery. They're not actually making the bike, though. Actually, they licensed it to another company called Greener Power Sports. They have a kid's version and an adult's version. And then there's Streamo. This is Honda's newest micro-mobility venture to develop an electric scooter or e-scooter for urbanites. Most city dwellers are already familiar with the growing hype, and we can see more electric scooters passing by to cover short distances across the city. Well, now Honda's in the game. So you can see how Honda as a whole is moving forward with electrification across all its businesses. But now you tell me, if you could name the new Honda Sony company, what would you name it? Do you think Honda Sony Venture can even beat Tesla? Please share your opinion by commenting below. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for your support.